still under the application of genetic technology in medicine, we have to talk about something known as genetic screening. By definition, genetic screening is the testing of an embryo, fetus or the adult for the presence of specific alleles. Another way of defining genetic screening is to say we want to determine the genotype of the person. We want to know what type of alleles they have in their body. Now, if you do not have a genetic disease or your family history does not show any presence of genetic diseases, you may think that, okay, I don't actually need to do genetic screening. But consider a situation where, for example, please do not, do not memorize this, a gene has two alleles and the large B dominant allele does not cause the disease, but the small B allele may cause the disease in the person. So why would people do a genetic screening? Sometimes couples may do genetic screening before they have a child because they want to find out what's their genotype. Are they homozygous dominant or are they heterozygous? Because the couples may not have the disease, but if they are heterozygous, they might have a 25% chance of getting a child with a genetic disease. Now, in some cases, the genetic disease may not be serious, but what if it were an extremely serious or sometimes fatal disease. So it's good for the couple to know what type of alleles they have in their body before they have kids or offsprings. Now, the second reason is expecting parents, especially when the mother is pregnant, the fetus is growing inside the mother's womb or uterus, but what if the parents are worried? What if the child has a genetic disease and they might grow up and suffer due to this genetic disease? So they want to test the fetus alleles. To, that means they want to check the fetus genetic information to see whether the fetus may have the alleles or not. Now, what are some of the examples of genetic diseases that can be screened? Uh, one example is Huntington disease. We talked about it in chapter 16. I'm just going to put it put a link on the top right corner for you to have a revision on that if you have to. Sometimes we can also screen for potential breast cancers. Potential meaning to say the person does not have breast cancer, but we can check their genes to see if they have a particular allele um, that increases their risk of breast cancer. And those alleles that we will check for are the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene. The BRCA just stands for breast cancer. Some books will call it BRCA, BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. It's up to you. But BRCA1 and BRCA2 is just the way I'm pronouncing it. Pronouncing it. Now, for a normal BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene in a person, you don't technically need to memorize it. It's just good to know. When the genes are expressed, it causes cell death, especially when DNA damage is not repaired. And for BRCA2 gene, it prevents the cell from dividing uncontrollably. So these genes act normally to prevent cancer from happening because um, when BRCA1 is expressed, the cell will die, especially when the DNA is mutated. So that's a good thing. So in a cell, when the DNA is mutated, they may not behave properly. So the BRCA1 gene will be activated to cause that particular cell to die off. So that prevents cancer cells from forming. For the BRCA2 gene, obviously, when it is expressed, uh, it prevents the cells from dividing uncontrollably, and we know that dividing uncontrollably would usually lead to tumors, and we don't want that to happen as well. However, when the gene becomes mutated, for example, when the BRCA1 gene becomes mutated, there will be no cell death if DNA damage is not repaired. So DNA damage persists in the cell and the cell continues to live on and that's not a good thing because potentially it can become a cancer cell. And obviously mutated BRCA2 gene, it will cause the cells to divide uncontrollably and that's not a good thing as well because that's how it causes cancer. So genetic screening can check for potential breast cancer by assessing if the person has mutated BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. The third type of allele that we can also screen in a person is for a genetic disease known as cystic fibrosis. Now, you don't have to know the details of cystic fibrosis, but it's good to know how it works. 
uh, like as an overview of how it happens. Now, for cystic fibrosis, what exactly happens is um, there is a gene known as the CFTR gene. You don't have to memorize the full name. There is a large A and small a allele. Large A will code for a normal CFTR protein and the small a will code for usually a non-functional or no CFTR protein. And that's the problem. The, the recessive allele in this case is the issue which causes the disease. Now, I'm showing you two cells over here, and these two cells have mucus on their surface, especially in the trachea, uh, your bronchus, or even the lining of your intestines. Mucus are constantly present. Now, so mucus is there to usually to moisten, uh, to moisturize the area. It's also there to trap dust and pathogens. That's a good thing. However, let's look at a person if the cell has large A, large A, homozygous dominant, or large A, small A. Now, due to the presence of the dominant allele, they will have a CFTR protein on the cell surface membrane. The function of the CFTR protein is to pump out chloride ions into the mucus area. So why is that a big deal? So when it pumps out chloride ions into the mucus area, it causes the outside to have a higher solute concentration, the inside to have a lower solute concentration inside of the cell. Therefore, conversely, water potential will be switched. The inside will have a higher water potential. The outside has a lower water potential. Therefore, water moves out through the aquaporin by osmosis, and it causes the mucus to become, you know, it, it ex expands, it expands, and the texture of the mucus becomes runny or watery. And that's a good thing because you want the mucus to be watery and slippery so it can be easily removed by ciliated cells or it can easily move around uh, within the uh, organs like the trachea or the intestines. However, if the person is homozygous recessive, they will not have CFTR proteins produced, so no CFTR proteins will be on the cell surface membrane. Therefore, it will not be able to pump out chloride ions into the mucus area, so osmosis will not happen in this case, and because osmosis doesn't happen, the mucus does not become watery. The mucus remains very thick and viscous, and when it remains thick and viscous, viscous it cannot easily be removed by the ciliated cells or the cilia. So they remain stuck in that one particular area. And if that particular mucus builds up, imagine if it builds up in the trachea, accumulates in the uh, trachea or bronchi, they may cause blockage of the gas exchange system. And in some cases of cystic fibrosis, especially in the early 80s, we have heard of cases of infants dying because they had accumulated too much mucus in their gas exchange system, which led to choking. So they choked on their own mucus. So that's a serious disease as well. And we would like to treat this disease or screen for these diseases uh, because we are scared that Number one, we may be carriers, but that means we might be heterozygous. Or number two, if the woman is pregnant, uh, the parents might be scared that the fetus may be having cystic fibrosis. That means the fetus might be homozygous recessive. So some students will ask, how do we check for the person? How do we do genetic screening? We can do genetic screening in two ways. We can do genetic screening by gel electrophoresis, by separating the DNA and looking at the bands of DNA, or we can also do microarray to detect the presence of specific alleles. So those are the ways that we can use the gene tech to check for what type of alleles you have. Okay, it's quite easy to do genetic screening for adults because what we can do is you can just go to the lab or the genetic screening center and if you have the facility in your area and they'll just take out your cells, your any of your cells, your skin cells, your, you know, a skin cell, your epithelium cell in the inner lining of your cheek and you can check for what type of alleles you have. That's quite easy. But the problem here is prenatal diagnosis. That means we want to do genetic screening of the fetus before the mother gives birth. So you have a fetus over here and the fetus is growing and developing inside the mother's uterus. So when we want to do genetic screening of the fetus, we want the fetus cells. We don't want the mother cells because we want to screen the fetus because we want to know the genetic information or the nucleus, the chromosomes of the fetus. That's what we are interested with.
but the fetus is inside the mom's uterus. How do we get a hold of even a little bit of the fetus cells? Or how do we obtain the cells from the fetus? Now, there are three ways of doing it, and we are going to talk about the three ways. The first way is known as amniocentesis, and what that basically does is we would insert a needle through the abdominal area into the mother's womb, but we have to be careful. There's an ultrasound that is done together with it to make sure it does not pierce through any important structures. And what the doctor will do is collect the amnion fluid, that blue color area that surrounds the fetus. And why do we collect the fluid? Because the fluid contains fetus cells. Some of the cells are just broken up and floating around in the fluid, and we can get that. The second way is through the vagina, we will insert a needle and then the needle goes up the cervix and into the uterus. And that needle, I know I'm just drawing it as a bent needle, but you know, there's a specific shape for that, uh, uh, for that needle. And this technique is known as chorionic villus sampling. And what they will do is they will collect the placenta tissue of the fetus. The placenta is the part that attaches to the mother's lining to obtain nutrients. A lot of times, students assume that the placenta belongs to the mother. No, it does not. The placenta actually belongs to the fetus. So logically, the cells in the placenta will have nucleus, and the nucleus is just the fetus chromosome. It contains the fetus chromosomes as well. So it's just that when the mother gives birth, yes, we will deliver the baby and we will also remove the placenta, but of course the placenta is discarded. You are not attached to your placenta forever. Anyway, so you can get these two techniques. Now, right off the bat, I like to ask my students the question, between these two techniques, obviously it's quite risky because you're in, you're poking through the area and you're not taking tissues or uh, fluid out. Which technique is riskier? And most of the time, students will say chorionic villus sampling is riskier than amniocentesis. That is very true, but uh, there is a reason why sometimes chorionic villus sampling is done. Because amniocentesis can only be done upwards of the 15th to the 16th weeks of pregnancy. But chorionic villus sampling can be done much earlier. So if there's any problems with the fetus, the parents can make a faster decision, okay, when the fetus is still not fully developed. So chorionic villus sampling is done at 10 to 13 weeks of pregnancy. However, both of them have risks, as I've mentioned. Amniocentesis will have a lower miscarriage risk, and a chorionic villus sampling will have a higher miscarriage risk. That means uh, it may stimulate the uterus suddenly to contract, and it may push the fetus out, even though the fetus is not ready to come out. So that's, that's not a good thing, obviously. So when parents want to do these techniques, uh, this genetic screening for their fetus, they have to be extremely careful. They have to be wary and aware of the risks that will be happening. And we will discuss this further when we are talking about the ethics of genetic screening. Now, instead of relying on amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling, there is another way. Because here's the interesting thing. What may happen sometimes is, remember I told you that the fetus, uh, the placenta cells and the fetus is attached to the lining and the lining is sort of attached to the mother's uh, circulatory system. It's not directly attached, but it's uh, indirectly attached to the mother's circulatory system, which I've represented in the red line. Something weird can sometimes happen where the fetus cells, some of the fetus cells or the cells of the fetus may enter the mother's circulatory system. Yes, this has been known to happen as well. And if some of the fetus cells enters the mother's circulatory system, we can do a blood test where we can collect the mother's blood where the mother's blood may contain some of the fetus cells. Keyword here is it may contain fetus cells. It's not a 100% guarantee though. So you don't have to poke the mother through her chest or such. You can just take the mother's blood through her veins from her arm. That's easy. So it's not risky. It's not as risky as amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling, where uh, when we filter out the blood and identify the fetus cells, we can take the fetus cells and do genetic screening directly. So that's a good thing because in this case, you are not poking the amniotic sac directly. You're not 
disturbing the placenta, so there's no miscarriage risk. However, it comes with its own disadvantages. It is, like I said, it when you take the mother's blood, it may contain fetal cells, or even if it does contain fetal cells, it may contain broken up fetal cells. So the fetal cells may not have the correct number of chromosomes. So that means you cannot do a full genetic screening of the cells. So it is not as accurate as amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling, CVS. That's just the shortened form of chorionic villus sampling. So these are some of the issues when you're talking about the particular technique.